Thank you, Ami. When I first took up the role of director at British Muslims for Secular Democracy in 2009, I received a shower of emails, blog mentions and social media alerts ranging from utter confusion to outbursts of unprovoked anger. How could a Muslim organisation in the UK openly and proactively promote secular democracy, people demanded? Wasn't this at odds with the Quran and Hadith? Asked both conservative Muslims and non-religious secularists at the opposite end of the spectrum. Five years on, I think the best testament to BMSD's articulation of a liberal Muslim voice is the fact that I get asked this question far less frequently. We have worked closely with secular activists of all stripes on a range of topical issues that strike at the heart of tensions between the religious and the secular, from the inclusion of women and LGBT people in religious spaces, to the treatment of minority sects like Amadi Muslims, to gender segregation in universities. We tried to lead the way on these issues rather than being at the sidelines. For example, I'm one of the few Muslim civil society leaders who has openly called for more LGBT friendly <coughs> mosques and religious organisations in their capacity as both places of worship and as employers. In fact, I've joined the committee of a wonderful group called the Inclusive Mosque Initiative, which aims to do exactly that. A group of British Muslim civil society leaders, including myself, spoke at a groundbreaking conference on diversity in Islam, organised by the Muslim Institute and an LGBT Muslim organisation a few weeks ago. While this is highly commendable work, it speaks volumes that only some were willing to be identified publicly as speakers. This kind of stigma can only be erased and secular ideologies mainstreamed if more Muslim activists are willing to stick their heads above the parapet on this and similar issues. I cannot, try to t I cannot tell them what to do, but I can try to lead by example. My organisation, British Muslims for Secular Democracy, had already set the ball rolling by being the first British Muslim organisation to openly challenge the extremist group al Mahajarun. In one video on the BMSD website, an angry young Muslim begins ominously, I have a message for those who insult Islam, before adding, let's agree to disagree. This video was used to promote BMSD's counter-protest against al Mahajarun in October 2009, which attracted 150 attendees in Piccadilly Circus. It received 10,000 hits on YouTube in just four days. What happened two years later? Other mus mainstream Muslim groups, like the Islamic Society of Britain, felt empowered enough to join a coalition of religious and non-religious groups, including mine, to organise a protest against al Mahajirun and their poppy burners on Remembrance Day 2011. While the group were banned by the Home Secretary the night before the pro protest, our planned counter-protest sent out a clear message that people from a diverse range of backgrounds were not willing to let their pernicious activities go unchallenged. Even in cases where it's pretty unlikely that the status quo will be changed uh, anytime soon, for example, increasing the number of women and LGBT people on existing mosque committees, what we can do is set up our own alternatives. The aforementioned Inclusive Mosque Initiative is a great example of this. We know that there is a cohort of British Muslims who have a problem with government-funded charities or having certain values imposed on them top-down. Well, this initiative was set up organically by Muslims who were fed up with the status quo with no funding to speak of. They had an inclusive pop-up prayer space featuring women who lead mixed prayers and a committee with openly uh, LGBT Muslims on it. On top of this, they have organised taboo-busting events on subjects like Islam and mental health and humanistic Islam. Going back to BMSD, while we do not delve into theology in any great level of detail and our main concern is with the civic engagement of Muslims, we have engaged with and spearheaded various endeavours that do invoke theological arguments. In 2012, we hosted a talk at Queen Mary University with Manwar Ali, chief executive of a Muslim charity called Jimas. He outlined his moral, philosophical and spiritual trajectory from a rocky start as a Muhajideen who went to fight in Afghanistan to a Muslim leader who actively embraced his secular democracy and self-defined as broad-minded. He stated that secular management of religious spaces had enabled him to educate other people about his beliefs without imposing on them. He said it was important to distinguish between hard secularism, where individuals were discouraged from having any kind of religious affiliation at all, 
and soft secularism, where the state remains neutral as a means of negotiating between different religious and non-religious expressions in the public sphere. He quoted the Quran on the importance of pluralism and drew parallels between Islamic concepts like consultation, consensus, dignity, collective interest, justice, intellect, with their equivalents in modern secular democracies. So groundbreaking was this talk that typical feedback from attendees looked like this. I was a bit dubious about attending a debate on Islam and secular democracy and the compatibility between the two. However, Mama Ali's views were refreshing and so they gave me some food for thought. The fact that he had held the opposite view in the past greatly added to his credibility as someone who had seen the light. Louis Safi, a member of the board of directors of the Washington DC based Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy, also sees a good fit. He says, I think that Islam has a set of norms and ideals that emphasizes the equality of people, the accountability of leaders to community, and the respect of diversity and other faiths is fully compatible with democracy. I don't see how it could be compatible with a government that would take away those values. But do British Muslims agree with this view as a whole? Britain is often described as a society which adheres to procedural secularism. Theoretically, this means that it enables all voices, whether religious or not, to access the public sphere equally. In contextualising Islam in Britain, two rigorous research projects conducted by Cambridge University that asked a diverse group of Muslim participants to answer the question, what does it mean to live faithfully as a Muslim in Britain today? An overwhelming majority of participants affirmed their support for this model. They observed that procedural secularism provides many benefits for Muslims, including religious freedom. As British Muslims, we are able, for the most part, to practice our faith in an atmosphere of respect and security, with recourse to established anti-discrimination provisions if this is not the case. The Measuring Anti-Muslim Attacks Project is a prime example. Many other European countries have far worse problems in terms of the scale of anti-Muslim sentiment, yet they do not have designated reporting and mapping mechanisms for such crimes, let alone anything that has buy-in from national governments or mainstream organisations like Victim Support or Neighbourhood Watch. Meanwhile, proponents of ideological secularism often cite the negative role that religion can play when it comes to issues like women's rights as grounds for their objection to allowing religion into the public sphere at all. When hardline religious activists and preachers speak out against women's rights and use supposedly religious arguments, this furthers such misconceptions. Some extreme acts have more to do with culture than religion. For example, forced marriage is a negative cultural practice. Although associated with Islam, it is actually at odds with Islamic history, which includes examples of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ending marriages in which consent have not been sought. However, Attributing all of these negative practices to culture alone is a whitewash. Several theological arguments are usually advanced on the alleged impermissibility of marriage between Muslim women and non-Muslim men, for example. Fortunately, we have experienced and confident Islamic scholars like Dr. Assam Hassan, Gafar's colleague, who have rebutted these arguments in public. I am also a huge believer in the use of arts and culture when it comes to challenging these norms, which is why I am the executive producer of a documentary called Hidden Heart, featuring three Muslim women who married non-Muslim men and the backlash they faced as a result. If the majority of British Muslims do support procedural secularism as a system, then what about activists from other backgrounds and forging links of commonality between all of us? I think this boils down to two things. Number one, clarifying the values we subscribe to, and number two, a strong commitment to social action. Manwa Ali's 2012 talk provided some answers on the first point. He had quoted former MP Michael Wills in enunciating what British values actually were, creativity, openness, tolerance and adaptability. These values were described as Islamic. <coughs> In continuing the list of British values, Manwa added human dignity, understanding the narrative of the other and how to frame grievances. The overarching value was, of course, the need to build strong communities. This leads us nicely into the second point. Within a procedural secular state such as Britain, Muslims have rights and responsibilities that are in keeping with Islamic teachings. Far from advocating withdrawal from society, mainstream Islamic scholarship regards civic engagement as highly desirable for Muslim citizens. 
Understanding that being a religious Muslim in Britain today also means living a full life as a citizen, with all the rights and responsibilities that entails, is a crucial step to becoming well-adjusted citizens in today's Britain. Islamic history has something to say about the link between citizenship and religion as well. Imam Abu Ishaq al shatibi an Andalusian scholar who lived in the 14th century, articulated this principle in his work of the Makassid al-Sharia, or Goals of the Sharia. He drew parallels between citizens' rights and responsibilities in the state, such as freedom of conscience, the right to speak out against tyranny, and the objectives of Islam, 